and that's already being translated into cures. Hundreds of clinical trials are currently recruiting for stem cells from cord blood. A quick look at the top 10 causes of death in the United States and studies that show that they can or are being treated using stem cells from cord blood proves that you couldn't get a bigger bang for your buck. The number one killer in the United States is heart disease. Stem cells from umbilical cords effectively treated heart attacks in animal studies, according to Robert J. Henning, an MD, and his colleagues at the University of South Florida, or USF. When injected into rats soon after a heart attack, stem cells taken from human umbilical cord blood greatly reduced the size of heart damage and restored pumping function to near normal. This improvement occurred without need of drugs to prevent the rat's immune system from rejecting the human cells. Human umbilical cord stem cells were injected directly into the heart muscle of rats one hour after heart attacks were induced. After four months of recovery, the size of the scar tissue left by dead heart muscle was approximately three times smaller in the human umbilical cord blood treated rats than in the untreated rats. And as a result, the heart's pumping capacity improved to near normal in the treated rats. Considering over 800,000 people annually survive a heart attack, this is a very, very important path to follow. Indeed, in human trials, improved heart health has been observed within weeks when stem cells from cord blood has been given to repair damaged heart muscle after a heart attack. Furthermore, human trials have already shown some success in giving these stem cells to grow new blood vessels and improve circulation. This has worked even on coronary blood vessels with people growing their own bypasses, and it's speculated they could even be used to prevent or treat strokes. Ten years ago, uh, I was diagnosed with leukemia. Uh, surprise for me, no symptoms, you know, you don't know you have it. Um, back then the only, uh, the only cure for leukemia was a bone marrow transplant. My, uh, I needed a transplant a year and a half after diagnosis, which is quick. Uh, no brothers, no sisters, no unrelated marrow match in the registry. They sent me home to get my affairs in order happened to be in the right place at the right time for a clinical trial using cord blood stem cells instead of bone marrow. Um, the trick was to see if a small unit of cord blood could transplant a very large, very ill adult. And uh, in order for that to go forward, uh, the New York Blood Center's cord blood program was able to find a perfect match for me in their inventory. Some mother had done 10 years ago what mothers weren't doing and that was to donate her newborn's cord blood to a public inventory. And that was my one and only perfect match. The rest is history. Here I am. How do you feel? I feel um, delighted with my good fortune. I feel sad that other leukemia patients have not been as lucky as I have been. And in time, they will be able to follow me down this same path not because of luck, but because of all the advances that, that are being made and with a bigger inventory of cord blood. As you watch this debate unfold about embryonic, adult stem cell, cord blood, what are your impressions uh, as someone who's been a beneficiary of adult, cord, or adult stem cells? Uh, I feel bad for the patient community. You know, when you're desperate for anything, you will listen to, you will perceive a message as being a cure tomorrow. You get all hyped, you get ready for uh, getting rid of your debilitating disease, and that's just not the case. Um, patients uh, are frustrated that they are not seeing embryonic stem cell cures, um, and unless there is more attention, we need to refocus attention on what's working and save the promises and the what-ifs for another time. Use what works and then the rest will sort itself out. The second leading cause of death in the United States is cancer. And without question, the vast majority of the clinical trials currently recruiting are for cancers. Their effectiveness is mostly in the recovery from the chemo, but they are also being investigated to targeting the sick areas by bringing drugs or new genes to abnormal places. Because of the sheer volume of work, I'm going to limit it to a few statements. All right. We know that umbilical cord blood transplants are successful in children with a high-risk acute lymphocytic leukemia, that they increase the odds of finding a suitable transplant donor 
improved survival for high-risk children with leukemia, and that in cases of prostate cancer, umbilical cord blood injection delayed the onset and improves the survival rate of these individuals. The third leading cause of death is stroke, and it's been found that transplantation of human cord blood stem cells into laboratory rodents with experimental strokes resulted in significant reductions in the size of brain lesions and improved these animals' use of their limbs. In fact, stroke size was reduced by 40% when cord blood was given intravenously. So basically, injecting cord blood has been shown to significantly reduce stroke damage. But these cells seek out and repair the damage quickly, a procedure that could be done in any emergency room. Pair that to therapies you imagine being used with embryonic stem cells. The patient would have to have surgery to remove and replace the damaged brain and circulatory tissues and live on immune-suppressing drugs for the rest of their lives. You'll note that heart repair was also induced with injections as well. We move on. Fourth cause of death is chronic lung disease, and researchers at the University of Minnesota have, for the first time, coaxed umbilical cord blood stem cells to differentiate into a type of lung cell. This exemplifies why cord blood can be considered the equivalent of embryonic when it comes to reparative therapies. Perhaps better, since the rate of rejection is considered lower with cord blood than mature tissue from unrelated donor. Now, no one could reasonably expect stem cells to help either number five, accidents, or number six, pneumonia and flu, so we're going to move right on to number seven, diabetes. Cord blood stem cells have been stimulated to differentiate into functional insulin-producing cells in vivo, or in the body, and eliminated hyperglycemia after transplantation into diabetic-induced mice model. Conversely, human embryonic stem cells have yet to produce insulin-producing cells that respond to sugar levels and aren't rejected by the subject. There are also several clinical trials underway using cord blood for diabetes treatment. One that is currently related, they're looking for 10 children into whom they will transfuse the umbilical cord blood in an attempt to regenerate pancreatic islet insulin-producing beta cells and improve blood glucose control. Also, pancreas-developing markers have been expressed in human umbilical cord blood cells, opening up the possibility of differentiation and repair of this vital organ as well. The eighth cause of death in the United States is suicide, and I don't think we expect that to be helped with cord blood, but there have been some interesting developments for number nine, kidney disease, where it's been found that the mesenchymal stem cells, which exist in cord blood, do exhibit reparative potential in acute renal failure. And the tenth cause of disease is chronic liver disease. And not only has human umbilical cord blood helped in models of toxic liver injuries, we can now take the stem cells from umbilical cord blood and make them into mini livers. But there's more beyond the top 10 causes of death in the United States. For neurological issues, it's been shown that cord blood-derived stem cells differentiate into functional neuron-like cells in vitro or outside the body, which is probably why the umbilical cord blood transplantation improves mobility after spinal cord injury. Yet cord blood does not have to become brain cells to protect the brain. 